I'm Amanda Leitner, and welcome to Rochester Rising, where I amplify the stories of Rochester entrepreneurs. Welcome to episode 191 of the podcast today. So on the show today, we listen into a recent E1 Tech Talk with local entrepreneur and founder Scott Schwalbe. Scott is the co-founder and CEO of NimbleLink, where he's responsible for the corporate vision, strategy, and overall leadership of the company. NimbleLink is a locally grown business. It's an internet of things cellular solutions company that connects people, products, and things to the internet. So we have a great conversation with Scott brought to you by E1 or Entrepreneurs First. So if you haven't heard of E1 yet and you're a tech entrepreneur in Southeast Minnesota, you should learn about them. E1 is a collaboration of entrepreneurial support organizations in Southeast Minnesota that are funded through the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development's Launch Minnesota program. And the purpose of this group is to provide additional support to tech entrepreneurs within our ecosystem. And these E1 Tech Talks are a monthly series to provide inspiration and support for tech entrepreneurs in the community. So on the podcast today, which is hosted by E1 member Christine Beach, we get to hear um, from Scott about his transition from corporate leadership roles to becoming what he calls a reluctant entrepreneur how he grew his company from one to 25 employees to extend the NimbyLink family, his advice to get connected in with entrepreneurs that are further along the journey than yourself, and conversations you should have with a co-founder versus a potential first hire. So tune in for this honest conversation about starting a tech company in Minnesota with Scott Schwalbe of NimbyLink. So thanks so much to tuning in to the podcast today. A reminder that you can find us really anywhere you listen in to podcasts. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, and I really want to encourage everyone to check out our YouTube channel. So Rochester Rising has its has our own YouTube channel, and within the channel we have our own playlist for the podcasts. So if you're a big YouTube fan, Go to our YouTube page, subscribe to our channel, make sure you're getting notified of the latest podcasts, and you can listen into them as well there. We don't have video that goes along with the audio, but it, it's kind of a still um, image from our conversation, but it's another great way to connect in and listen to our content, so check it out. Rochester Rising also has a second podcast called Ecosystem North that launched last month. Ecosystem North talks with entrepreneurial ecosystem builders within Minnesota to understand what drives them to support entrepreneurs. And new episodes of Ecosystem North launch every Friday. And you can check those out as well on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our YouTube channel. Rochester Rising is the storytelling arm of Collider, which is a nonprofit based in Rochester, Minnesota that supports early stage Rochester entrepreneurs. You can learn more about our sister organization at Collider.mn. All right, so now let's jump right into the podcast today with the E1 Tech Talks with Scott Schwabe. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christine Beach, and I have the pleasure of representing the E1 and moderating this session today. The E1 is a collaboration of entrepreneurial support organizations throughout Southeast Minnesota. We're funded by the state under the Deeds Launch Minnesota program. And the idea is for us to support our local entrepreneurs. So today, as part of our programming, we're pleased to bring you the story of a Minnesota tech company that started just seven years ago and has already garnered quite a bit of attention and several accolades from national organizations. We have Scott Schwabley with us to share the NimbleLink story. As co-founder and CEO of NimbleLink, Scott has a long history of building profitable businesses and successful teams. In his role there, he is responsible for corporate vision, strategy, and the overall leadership of the company. Founded in 2013, NimbleLink was recognized in 2018 so just five short years later, as one of Deloitte's 2018 Technology Fast 500. And this year, Inc. Magazine placed NimbleLink at number 77 on its inaugural Inc. 5000 series Midwest list. 
the most prestigious ranking of the fastest growing private companies in the Midwest. Prior to founding NimbleLink, Scott held leadership roles for several industry leading companies, including Logic PD, HDM, and Celestica. He also served and retired after 20 years in the US Navy as a cryptologic linguist. Welcome, Scott. Well, thanks, Christine. Good to be here. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the company and kind of what is going on uh, with the firm and how you got to where you are. But let's start by getting to know you a bit. What led to your personal transition from corporate leadership roles to making the entrepreneurial leap? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, as a yeah, initially, I'd, I'd say I'm the reluctant entrepreneur, uh, as uh, as we were going through. But in reality, I I had dabbled in entrepreneur uh, endeavors throughout, even while I was in the Navy. So I always had an interest to do something, uh, to uh, do something on the side, figure out what to do. But you know, at my last uh, period of time, you know, at my last company. Uh, in each company, you're, you're creating value, you're doing things, you're seeing, you're learning more. Uh, and it finally came to the point where it was just uh, just time to you know, take control, uh, to be in charge, to uh, actually drive uh, some of our own ideas. And my partner and I uh, had some uh, you know, uh, you know, good inter- you know, engagement with the market, understood some, uh, some things. And we actually tried to be entrepreneurs. We tried to uh, uh, launch uh, our thoughts and products within our company, and they just really weren't interested. So we, we tried that first and decided to uh, uh, to, to, to step out and uh, start nimbling. So you both worked for the same company before? We did, yeah. So we were okay. working together, and uh, we actually uh, um, were very open about uh, you know some of the things that we were working on and, and saw uh, some market need. Uh, and saw some great opportunities in the market and decided that we would uh, um, try to launch a product. And, we, and again, we tried to launch it within the company and, and uh, uh, we, we couldn't get the backing and the interest. And, and, uh, and we actually were very open and got their approval to take, you know, it was, you know, ideas that really weren't in comp- competition with the company. So it wasn't gotcha. like we snuck off and uh, did it. So it was, it was very much in the open deciding to, to go do this because it was a little different avenue, which so I can understand why they didn't want to do it. Right. So, well, tell us about this idea that launched Nimbleink. Yeah. So, back in 2013, it's interesting as we look at the you know uh, technology from cellular. You know, we were we were still uh, just at the end of uh, the 2G uh, network, even you know just seven years ago. And you yeah. think. You know, and you know, now the big hype around the fifth generation, 5G. So we went from two to three to four. But it, back uh, machine-to-machine communications and machines talking to each other and, and really creating uh, um, you know, the, the ability for uh, a way for machines to quickly connect that weren't necessarily co- uh, connected with cellular right away uh, to create uh, some hardware that could uh, integrate and, and, and wrapping that machine-to-machine Activity and our first I actually had uh, worked with a um, a group that had uh, um, a little product called the Text Alert. It was a little box that uh, had the uh, the ability to send a text message if uh, the temperature went out of range or if there was some motion or if we lost power. So we were really you know that was our first initial product to uh, to launch into the marketplace. Just a simple text alerting if you lose power. Uh, oh neat. Yeah. And so is that still in the market or no? It's not. You know, we've, you know, there's plenty of products like that in the market. Uh, our current product was, is not in the market anymore. We, uh, we, we ended up uh, moving more towards down into the, uh, um, the module components of, of what goes inside that product and really drove to, to, to pivot it a little bit. You know, in 13, it was, uh, it's interesting that we, uh, we actually used, we, we, uh, applied for the Minnesota Cup competition in 2013, and we were uh, uh, we were we didn't make the finalists, but that whole process was just an awesome process to to, to focus on our business plan. And maybe we can talk about that at some point. Some of those uh, different opportunities within uh, within Minnesota here. So you kind of touched on a little bit, but tech is always evolving and changing. So how how are you making the deci- decision when you want to? Um, drop a product out of tech, you know, production or start a new one. Sure. So in co- some cases you're just forced. 
So, and you're especially on cellular uh, as we're working with the uh, the networks when uh, when the, the cellular carriers came out and said we are just going to shut down the towers and no longer support a technology that probably makes for that makes for a pretty easy uh, decision. Well, not easy, but yeah, we we move it. But as we um, evolve and look, it's so it's so important to uh, be connected with uh, the market with your customers. Uh, we found, you know, initially we were driven, you know, because if you get too driven just by the technology, you can get caught going down an avenue of being too early, uh, building something that's just not quite ready. But if if you're if you've got, you know, one, uh, you know, ear to the the ground listening to the market and talking to the customers, and the other one looking at the forward technologies, it's that balance act of uh, determining when to launch a product. So we do a we we we. While we're small yet, and we're we're still driving, and we got a a pretty uh, you know small team, we're we're trying to pull in that market intelligence and listen to the customer uh, because that's you know, that. And then a typical you know, while it might be streamlined a market requirements document to a products requirements document to to then your you know to you know to drive through the new new uh, product uh, introduction process and be agile. I mean, we've uh, launched some products that. Uh, we weren't quite sure, and we launched them as fast as we could to get them out in the market and start getting them tested. So we're trying to use that methodology also. So as you're talking about launching different product lines and growing quite a bit over these last seven years, um, can you tell talk to us a little bit about you know some of the challenges you faced and and if there were times where the ecosystem somehow helped you, what were those? Sure. So I think... Uh, Growing a, a small business uh, uh, capital uh, is something that's always important uh, as you, uh, you know, as as you're building that. And then the second thing is is getting the right people in the right seats and moving forward. And then and then that balance. So through the through the years, uh, there's definitely been times when you know we've we've needed uh, funding or we just wanted to do something. And in order to hire, we needed funding. Uh, so that's always a it seems like it's always ongoing uh, as far as continuing to, to be engaged with the, um, uh, the community of investors or potential investors if you're going to grow to it and could continue to grow. And then, and we were fortunate we had a, a, a network of uh, people that we've worked with in, in the Minneapolis and Rochester area. So, so finding uh, the right people to get to this level has, been, uh, has not been as, as much of a challenge, but you mentioned the ecosystem. You know, I mentioned earlier uh, we uh, applied for the Minnesota Cup competition. Uh, that process uh, automatically ties into uh, the you know the Midwest, you know, especially the Minneapolis community of uh, of potential investors. You you get a mentor and they help you with your uh, your business plan. So early on, while there's only a couple of us in the business, uh, that's a great uh, uh, a great avenue. And then. Uh, uh, the Minnesota Angel tax credit was uh, was available, and uh, so we took advantage of uh, the Minnesota Angel tax credit for some of our um, you know our early stage funding in 2014 and 15, uh, and that was uh, and I think that was really a, a, a trigger point that pushed some of the investors out you know to the to saying yes uh, because uh, the fact that they got it you know they were able to get a tax credit um, you know from the uh, from the the, the state. Um, we didn't, um, in the ecosystem of, uh, angel investors, we didn't really find a lot of support in the, uh, um, in the Minnesota area for that. Uh, it's, uh, coming, you know, with a, a tech hardware company, uh, it's, uh, it's not as, uh, sexy as medical or as, uh, software as a service or some of the, uh, the other, you know, you get into, uh, uh, certain areas and pockets, you know, uh, medical, it seems, you know, is where a lot of the money is going and, and, and driving to. And then, you know, like I said, software as a service, uh, something that's software related uh, is the focus. So we had to go outside of uh, uh, the Minnesota area to get uh, more institutional funding in later on in 2016. But uh, yeah, go ahead. Do you think that's changing at all, that we're seeing more venture capital enter into the state? I think there might be more money coming in, but I still think it's very focused in uh, very focused, uh, you know, in, in medical uh, and 
you know, on some specific software. So, you know, I see, you know, you're seeing more ag maybe, uh, uh, there's uh, there's definitely some interest in uh, in uh, in ag, and and I have not uh, you know, been real close to it in the last uh, you know 24 months or so. But I don't see uh, a lot of the money coming in you know from a, from a hardware you know specific you know tech uh, depending on uh, you know there's the Internet of Things IoT which we're in the middle of uh, depending on which uh, part of the uh, the stack you're in if in analytics or in uh, you know, from the sensor, uh, the money is more focused on more of the analytics, the, the big data, uh, the, the recurring, which which we touch all those, but that's not our, our core focus. Uh, it makes it a little more difficult. Yeah. So what's been the most exciting thing as you've kind of grown through this growth spurt? Yeah. Uh, so one was, the you know, obviously we went from, you know, my partner Kurt and I, and now we have roughly 24, 25 employees. So, so growing uh, the the Nibbling family uh, in, in in the business, uh, being able to bring uh, you know uh, good people into the business has been exciting, been fun, and you know, and, and being able to to do that. Um, obviously, uh, yeah, we're very uh, uh, you know very blessed with a, a lot of really good customers. Uh, get to, you know, good relationships that we've built along the way. Uh, you know, I was talking to somebody uh, actually earlier today about, uh, you know, um, culture and vision and, and uh, it's the, the relationships. Uh, it's just uh, it's so important to, uh, to continue to build those. And so we're building really good uh, relationships. You know, I think the one big surprising thing that, uh, that it, you know, probably two years ago really kind of shocked me is that, people knew us from all around the United States, you know, that, you know, it's, uh, uh, especially in today's world, if you do the right digital marketing, you go to the trade shows and you get into the market, uh, you can create a brand very quickly uh, and create a, you know, a large brand and get recognition. And, and you're thinking, you know, we're just a you know, small little company here in Minnesota. And then you start showing up at trade shows and start talking to people. Oh yeah, we've heard of you. So that, that's always exciting to, 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 to to know, you know, to, to see those types of things. So it's been, uh, it's been fun uh, to get the, the recognitions like you had mentioned earlier for the company uh, mm -hmm. and just, uh, and seeing the, uh, the ability to, uh, to grow and, and, uh, and create a business. It's been uh, uh, a challenge, but, uh, but, but fun at the same time. I would think so. If you go somewhere else and they know who you are, that's pretty yeah. cool, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So getting those accolades that we mentioned earlier on, did that help, do you think, with your uh, raising of capital? Um, so the accolades didn't come until after raising of capital. Uh -huh. okay. uh, but it doesn't mean that it might not help going forward. Uh, you know, uh, what I found is that uh, the accolades probably help more in getting customers in business development um, because if we're talking to a fortune 500 company or fortune 100 or we're talking to larger corporate and and they see recognition by you know inc 5000 or deloitte or or the fast 50 or, or some of these things in minnesota it actually builds some credibility uh, we won the minnesota high tech technia award a few years ago for iot uh, so some of those things are really uh, helpful to uh, um, from the business development, but but then the other aspect is really interesting. Now we just we were just uh, recognized uh, third year in a row on the Inc. Five Thousand, you know, you know, Fast Five Thousand, and and even before we announce it, I probably have twenty to thirty new friends trying to sell me a service, <laughs> uh, and uh, so so there's definitely uh, groups uh, watching that, and so I think. You know, right now it's been more of a, you know, uh, yeah, not early on, you know, early on at the fir first time you, you do those things for that very reason to create credibility, to create brand. Um, you know, so they're, they're important early on. You know, now I'm not sure the, uh, the importance to, uh, because ultimately to raise money now they're going to, first thing, all right, let's look at the income statement, the balance sheet, and uh, that, that award's nice, but, you know, let's dive deep. Right. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. So <clears throat> when a lot of the people who are accessing our resources are trying to launch a tech company or, or they're in the beginning stages of launching a tech company, 
So what kind of advice would you give them? Yeah. Um, and maybe, you know, and it's probably, you know, obviously tech companies and, and any company is probably some of the similar advice, but very specifically, uh, you know, to the tech company, um, you know, obviously, you know, I think there's lots of great resources right now if, uh, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Minnesota with accelerators and with uh, boot camps and, and uh, I guess the Minnesota Cup get connected with uh, people that have done it uh, because there's a lot of uh, 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 just people that want to help there. You know, they're, they don't, there's, they're, they're offering uh, assistance to create your business plan, to create your financial plan, uh, you know, to, to create your network. Uh, so, so I would say that would be probably the, my, you know, the number one is don't be afraid to ask for, for help and seek help. Keep, um, you know, I think the initial thinking is like everybody wants to take a piece of my business, so they all want equity. So I got to share. I got to keep this to myself. But there's a ton of resources out there that aren't looking to take your equity and trying to get money. And so I think take advantage of, uh, of some of those. And even if they are willing, wanting to take a little bit of equity, it's probably well worth it if you've never done it before. And, um, and I think the other key area is to find somebody that's been in uh, a similar market that you're going into somebody that uh, understands the channels understands the uh, you know where to sell to understands you know your your target market understands how to position your company uh you know look for that type of help if you don't automatic if you don't have it already i think that's really key and i think yeah the other area is uh um there's no way that i that i would have succeeded at nimbly by myself having a co-founder it's just been, uh, you know, with, with my partner, Kurt, uh, you know, he's uh, really focused on, on the technology and, and, you know, he's got a great business mind and a great, in front, you know, with customers. And then, uh, you know, I'm more in the, uh, the business development and finance and kind of we came together and we had uh, complementary uh, skills that allowed us to do this because every day we had somebody to bounce off of and to support and to build up. So I think, you know, I, I, uh, I, for me personally, that, that worked very well. So, you know, it, we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses that I think uh, identifying those and not being afraid to uh, find somebody to compliment because uh, I've actually been and uh, have witnessed uh, businesses, very good uh, technology, very strong product. Um, and, and there was just uh, a lot of pride around the single owner and he w- would not let people in to help drive the business and the business is not uh, growing the way it could or it should. So I think allowing others to come in and, uh, and help and, and drive the business would be another area. You know, don't be afraid to uh, uh, hire the right people if, once you get that funding or once you, you know, figure out how to do that. And then the other, you know, back to the funding, uh, I'd say bootstrap as long as you can, uh, you know, because the longer you can, the more the more traction you can make, um, getting a prototype, getting uh, your product at least uh, in front of some customers, getting some good customer feedback, getting your business model tweaked a little bit so that you can actually have financials that have some backing of market intelligence or a couple of communications. Uh, and and obviously, if you could sell something, that would even be awesome. Uh, but, uh, you know, trying to... Uh, get some of that traction because the more traction you have when you do go out and, and raise money, um, typically it's going to be easier and the less, uh, less equity you're going to get, you know, um, give up of your company along the way. I think realize that, uh, you know, if you are in a, a business that is going to raise money and you're going to grow that, you're probably going to have to raise money two or three or four times, you know, different times. So, so don't give away all your equity the first time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, try to maintain, um, you know, control, uh, you know, of the, of the company and, 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 and really think through, uh, all money is not, uh, created equal, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, depending on, you know, really do, um, I t- I'll tell you that the investors, um, respect the fact that you're, um, interviewing them also. Uh, so you don't have to feel like you're just being the, uh, the, yeah, uh, you, you have the right to, you know, say yes or no, 
And, and while it doesn't feel like it's like, Oh my gosh, I, I need this money. I want, you know, but you know, at the same time, really, uh, think a lot about that because that's a partner, uh, you're getting and, and it's a lifetime partner or, or until uh, you do some transactions. I think it's another area. So, so I don't know. I jumped around quite a bit, but, uh, that's all good advice, right? I, I want to circle back. So I, yeah. earlier this week, I was on a, um, a virtual class call that Collider was hosting and Chris Lucanbill, who uh, runs Sherpa, was on talking about his company. And he was talking about the value of a co-founder and he was addressing the fact that um, your co-founder is kind of like your spouse, your work spouse, right? And that you have to have the right relationship. They have to be able to have a give and take. So what kinds of conversations did you guys have in order to figure out that you should join partner, be a partners in this and found together. And how do you decide whether someone is a co-founder or um, someone you hire? Sure. Sure. So um, I think I mentioned early on, Kurt and I did work together. Um, you know, so we, we did know each other a little bit there, uh, but it, again, we didn't, he didn't work for me and I didn't work for him and we were in two different parts of the group. So we didn't know each other that well. So, uh, you know, once we decided to do this and just started to get to know each other uh, a little better, it's it's uh, it's typical. You know, like you said, it's it's relationship. You know, do, can I work with this person? <laughs> you know, am I going to be able to? Do I trust them? Uh, do I? Uh, you know, is this somebody that uh, you know is does what they say they're going to do? Uh, you know, so kind of living the same uh, same value to and 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 what's their reputation? Do they have the have the skills to, to, to do the work. Um, and then, um, you know, I think the key then, after, you know, is communication, you know, through the process. We, uh, we uh, implemented early on the uh, uh, entrepreneurial operating system. Uh, um, and uh, in there, there's, you know, they, 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 they talk about having, uh, you know, communication between the, uh, the, 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 the visionary and the integrator or the, you know, the co-founders and uh, the people working together quite often. And you know, sometimes you get so busy, and and and, and Kurt and I don't have them as often as we uh, we should sometimes. But you know, we're you know seven years into this, and we 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 we, we totally trust each other now, and, and the relationships as good now as it was back then. So it's uh, um, your your question about founder or hire. Um, I think it's really around the risk of you know what does the uh, you know both partners want. Um, you know, if you've got an individual that's very good and wants to be uh, part of something, but they're not willing to take the risk of maybe not getting paid for a year, or uh, you know, or they don't want to take the risk of uh, uh, of, of, uh, of you know just throwing it all in, you know, then you know you might consider hiring. Uh, you know, I think that's you know kind of some of the trade-offs because ultimately uh, there's not a lot of money at the beginning, and and if your partner is willing to take some of that risk with you. Then it's only fair that if they're taking the risk, that they would actually be part owner uh, and, and, and co found So I think I think it really comes down to the you know finding the right person you know through you know either past relationships or connecting somewhere, and then really working through that uh, and understanding you know the risk profile, the desires, their commitment, their long term goals. Uh, so again, it's 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 similar to dating. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, you know getting married, and uh, and, uh, and 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 actually, there's uh, there's no divorcing at all, you know, because it's uh, you know you're you're together, and and you know, and I, I suspect that uh, if things go bad, it, it, you know, and fortunately for us, it's not. But I I haven't uh, I've seen a couple organizations where the partners just really struggled, and uh, and yeah, and it actually got to the point where it it, it uh, ruined the company um, mm-hmm. because. Uh, there's no, especially when you're small, there's, there's, uh, you know, and, and, you know, even if you're, you know, you know, 10, 20 million dollars, you know, it's just still, uh, you know, to break that apart at certain times is very difficult. So, but. so transitioning a little bit, I know you mentioned going through several rounds of, of funding, right? You're getting seed funding. Um, and there's a question that comes up quite often. What's more important, access to capital or access to people? And sometimes it seems like it's the same thing because you want the people who have the capital. Um, but is it human capital? Is it financial? Does it depend on the stage of the business? Yes. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. yeah so uh um yeah so let's, let's just talk about that and talk about the stages real quick and and uh, so initially um when you know kurt and i you know started it was you know just the two of us and we hired uh you know, one other person to come in help us put some marketing stuff together and and uh and she's still with us uh and uh we um we really went out and tried to get as much traction and i did have some networking of people that i'd worked with before that were willing to put a little bit of money in you know early we took as little as we possibly uh needed you know just to get started to you know get uh get a website up get you know get ourselves you know um that type of thing and and uh um and so access a little bit of network having some friends and family was 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 helpful um but then as we started to build the business model, looking, okay, now we want to grow. Here's the people we need to hire and bring on. Uh, identifying those people and what their skills were was important. But in, re- in reality, you can't hire them unless you have the money. Uh, because uh, most of those, uh, most of the people that uh, are out there in the, in the workplace aren't willing to come to work for, you know, half their pay for, you know, a year or, tw- you know, um, or 18 months. Uh, now, you, with once you get a little more traction, you know. So now, where we're at, you know, we can, you know, hire people and and maybe not, you know, we can offer some options. There's some things you can do with equity um, if you want to keep the salaries down. There's some trade offs, and there's and there's definitely people with that flexibility and there's uh, um, the ability to do that. But I think, uh, um, you know, so now, uh, you know, we're positive operating cash flow. You've got the, the funding we can hire a certain number of people. Now it's more about how fast do you want to accelerate? How fast do you want to go? So instead of hiring three salespeople over the next uh, six months, you want to go hire 10. Uh, and if you want to do that, then what else do you need and what other structure? And so now do you go out and raise some money? And, you, and then, but, but the question really comes, if you raise that money, everybody's diluted. And then, now you're starting over to actually create a new valuation. So you basically are creating another three to five year plan. So, so those are the, the interest. And I, and maybe um, one thing we haven't talked about is creating an advisory board or a board of directors, um, you know, know, is, is really important to be able to do that early on that uh, people that you can trust to help you through those decisions that actually have uh, um, a little bit of a vested interest, but not a lot. You know, it might be somebody that did invest, but somebody that didn't invest that has the skills uh, that's willing to uh, coach and advise, uh, you know, outside somebody that's not in your business on a daily basis. Uh, um, I, I think that's another area going back to uh, recommendation uh, to, to create, you know, you know, and it doesn't have to be an official board of directors. It could be an advisory board with, you know, technical sales, finance, raising money. If you can find those um, um, people, so that's your human those. capital that we were talking about. Yes, so, so if you need you, that mental capital that you can really tap into, just like sure. you need fiscal capital to tap into. Yeah, yeah, and then and then in order to get the human capital that actually is going to operate and execute. So um, oh, you're and thinking I, of human capital as your employee. I, I was yes. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I wasn't necessarily looking at the the human capital as the uh, uh, the the think uh, the advisors out there. So yeah, the big uh, brains that you get to access. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, going all the way back, that's where the uh, Minnesota Cup was uh, a very valuable process for us because uh, there's uh, you know the uh, the mentors in that in that organization are just superb and they they. They have a passion for uh, for helping uh, entrepreneurs and helping companies, and and they're going to put you through a process. and And there's some other competitions out there that that will actually force you, and they'll 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 coach you, and there's no cost, and and it's uh, it's basically you know going to take your time and, and effort. But uh, um, I I would highly that's a great uh, human capital resource. Uh, those yeah. types of activities, uh, and you know. And, and all, also all the other entrepreneurial uh, groups that, that you know that you're representing here, that you're pulling together. There's uh, there's uh, there's great opportunities to, to just go to them and and yeah. So if you mean human capital there? I would say that definitely uh, 
the human capital will pro- should come before the, the 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 financial because they will help you get the the right business plan and the right structure, and they will advise you to actually bring the money in properly. So something that we run up against when we're trying to help uh, entrepreneurs starting off is um, helping set expectations. Expectations for how do you get your first customer? How long is it before you can expect to do hit a break-even point? And as you mentioned, you get to a new round and valuations change. So break-even becomes a moving target. Sure. Right? But <clears throat> can you tell us about how you figured out how to get your first customer and how it went from there? Yeah. So, um, so we were... Um, I, I, as you mentioned, uh, you know, we were looking at this for a year before we launched the company. And so um, we actually had relationships with uh, with channels and partners. Uh, so we were already working closely uh, with uh, with Verizon um, and uh, and so had uh, the opportunity to, to take our product to, to to the to the channel and say, all right, you know, working with two or three people say, if, if we bring this to market, what do you think? And they're, they were excited about it. I said, well, let's go test it. So, so finding a, you know, identifying your sales channel is a, is an important part of uh, um, help, you know, helping you do that. Um, it probably, you know, we were, we were at revenue pretty quick. Um, you know, so, so, you know, I, you know, but when I say that, you know, I think in 2013, we started in February probably launched our product in August and we did, you know, 80,000 of revenue or something that year, you know, but isn't uh, that pretty, uh, I mean, that's pretty astounding, not typical, right. For a tech company, you know, especially hardware, I think, mm-hmm. you know, you know, software, depends on how you're building it out. Um, you know, uh, you know, again, uh, we, uh, and, and you think about this, you know, when, when you're doing a startup, you know, we, you know, you're not, uh, you know, there there are some startups that just come out with you know, technology that's never been developed, especially in the medical space. You know, they're working three, five, six, ten years on this. You know, with you know with a tech company and in you know and in, in you know there's a lot of opportunities to make technology better, um, add value to the technology. You know, do something unique to it, and that's really where we are. We took a you know a base technology that was already created and developed, and then we actually identified customer pain points that they couldn't use the technology the way it was being developed. And we added value to that technology to make it easier and make it nimble. And so we nimbly linked transparent, you know, the different technologies together, uh, disparate technologies to actually uh, make it easier for a customer to get into the IOT space. So, so is that how you iterate your product line is looking at what are those new technologies coming out and what are the pain points for customers to use them? Yeah, so if you look under, you know, if you go on our website and look under Nimble, Nimblelink, it's a smart, simple cellular. Uh, so, so we're always focused on um, cellular technology, and we've zeroed in. Uh, now, there's all other types of different, uh, you know, technologies out there that could be used for the, you know, our low power and our connectivity. And we're trying to make it simple so the customers can simply connect to it and get it get it uh, used, um, you know, fast. And so that's really as we look at identifying what are the pain points for a customer to get connected to cellular in the industrial space and construction space and the, the, the various industries that we're focused on. And then what is the best technology that, that we could bring to bear to do that? Who are those technology partners? And that's really drives our roadmap of, uh, and what are they looking to do? And, and then once we got into the cellular, we have to, you know, 3g and 4g and different categories of speeds and depending on which vertical we're going into, we're, 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 we're creating products and then, and we're doing a line of asset tracking solutions also. And so we basically are looking at, you know, what are, what's the supply chain looking for? What they, what do they want to track, you know, indoors and outdoors without power, you know, where was a gap in the, uh, um, in the technology and the, and, and what was being offered in the marketplace. And we identified that gap of there wasn't a, a real robust product that actually could be slapped onto a, you know, at the pallet level and track things going across the United States and going in and out of buildings. And so that's the technology we've created and trying to make that simple for the customer. So, so that's, we're trying to, you know, 
bring these technologies together. We're not creating the, you know, we're not creating the silicon. We're not creating the chipsets. We're we're taking the technology, bringing it together with you know a combination of hardware and software, and making it easier to use. So, so that can, allows that. Yeah, I'm just my brain is going through all the different applications. I'm thinking about tracking. You know, every time somebody moves, tracking your whole household goods from one place sure. to another. As you know, that's probably all you have in the world, and you put it on a moving truck, and you're trying to figure out if it's going to make it to the other destination. Yeah, I've uh, been through that. I've lost a couch. Can you imagine? How do you lose a couch in a move? Uh, lost so many things, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I mean, I, I was there when they put it on the truck. Right. And a month later, when they delivered to my house, I was there. Mm-hmm. And somewhere in that process, a large, a very large couch got lost. And so if I understand some of your technology correctly, you could create something where I could track my shipment from one end to the other. Correct. And, yeah. Under yeah. a visual or under a, some kind of tracking system. Yeah. And that, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, that's definitely could, could track it. We actually can, you know, track temperature um, also for, you know, those more perishable goods. You can track something, you know, if it's a, if it's a, not if it's moving and it's not supposed to moving with an accelerometer, uh, you know. So there's there's that basic tracking of in different ways of locating it using GPS and Wi-Fi and cellular triangulation, um, and and then you know our different you know there's a lot of there's there's competition there's products out there there's, there's solutions. And what we what we're doing is using the latest cellular technology on LTE M, which is you know. Kind of at the early stages of the 5G, and it's really low power, so we can create a simple little asset tracker that has four AA batteries, and and you could put it on something and wake it up two times a day, and it'll last six seven years on those two double four AA batteries. So yeah. so if you want to be some you know there's a lot of uh, assets that stay out in the field a long time and they move around and, and customers want to, you know, the, the OEMs want to know where they are. If they're large, large toolboxes, uh, you know, if there's, you know, large equipment that's out on a uh, construction job site, things moving, you know, from one place to another. So yeah, that's the, uh, another area of our focus. Which is, uh, so, so Scott, I, I understand that you're more B2B, right? You're, you're selling to businesses that are tracking these things. And it seems like in this time of COVID that it's really the businesses that are doing a lot of uh, shipping that are doing quite well, as opposed to maybe a downtown business kind of environment. So I'm wondering, does that translate into a positive impact for your business in this season? Or are you find, how are you finding yourself impacted by the COVID season? Yeah, so it's, uh, we haven't had a big spike. Uh, but we haven't had a big decline. So it's been, uh, you know, kind of steady as it goes. We're very diverse. Uh, you know, we're putting cellular modems in kiosks and, uh, and drones and, and then trackers and trucks. And, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, we're very, we're, we're very diverse. Uh, but, you know, we do work with a lot of earlier stage companies that were launch, launching products. Because we're, we're, we serve that long tail of the, the customers that buy lower volumes uh, in some cases. So there's been a mix of, a um, little hesitation. Maybe we won't launch our product right now. Uh, so definitely a little slowdown. We saw in April, May, June. We're actually starting to see confidence level come up in uh, in, a, in, in uh, customers where they're saying, "Hey, looks like uh, uh, you know it might never be over. Let's just get back to business." So uh, and uh, and they're starting to launch uh, you know their products again. We're starting to see that uh, pick up. But yeah, for us, we were fortunate. Like you said, we weren't in the hospitality and the retail and and uh, um, so we were fortunate to you know kind of make it you know kind of go through that and we're starting to see uh, um, you know a little uptick coming into the fourth quarter so we dipped a little bit here in the third quarter um, mm-hmm. just overall people just slowing down what they were what they were buying and right. tightening up the supply chain so you you kind of alluded to this idea that you maybe have something that's coming next. Can you tell us a little bit about what's next for your company? Yeah, you know, um, so two things. You know, as we look at um, this uh, in the asset tracking space, we uh, we're driving to uh, um, make it as small as we can and still make it robust. So we actually have a product coming out that actually will fit between the slots of a pallet. 
um, and it'll actually be able to screw, be screwed down onto the pallet. And then it'll actually have the ability to communicate with Bluetooth tags um, on, on other pallets or on, even on the same pallet. So if somebody wants to do, you know, temperature or humidity or something, you know, by the package level, or they want to know if that package is still attached to the pallet, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be able to get down to that level of, uh, of tracking uh, with this particular uh, solution, which is very exciting. Uh, you know, we see the market uh, continuing, as you mentioned, supply chain. People want to know where their stuff is. They want to know when they're going to get it. Um, and, and so we're excited about that launch here this fall. And, uh, and we're starting to do more with our, we have our modem. We're actually you know, doing more with the access of the processor, letting uh, um, our customers, which are mostly engineers and development teams, um, create their whole application in our Skywire modem that we sell. And, and so from a technology point of view, that, that's pretty exciting. Uh, so we have a, and then we're doing a little more with bundling data plans into our, uh, our, our, uh, our sales. So for a one-time cost, a uh, customer can buy our, our cellular modem and have data uh, a certain amount of data to use over the next five, seven years. So they don't have a recurring monthly charge. So we've got some differentiations in the, in the business models that we're trying to drive. So when you say customer, that's like a Verizon wireless as a nope, customer? Th- nope. Uh, uh, a customer is more like, a, you know, an OEM. Uh, you know, if you can think about any company out there, like uh, uh, I'm trying to think which ones I can talk about. Uh, the, uh, uh, so Verizon helps us, gets us into the market, and we sell their data line. So, so you think of uh, um, there's you know, uh, Coney, the elevator operator, has toolboxes that we you know that we track. We can talk you know talk about that. Um, we talk about uh, um, uh, I'm just not sure which customers I can name. You know, so you know it's, we don't talk okay. about customers. Yeah. I was all. trying to understand yeah. the but customers. Think about and yeah, a customer is somebody that builds a product, like somebody that's building. Uh, um, a generator, and they uh, an OEM because they sell business to business that builds a generator, and they want to integrate cellular technology inside their generator so they can actually know if it's running, know if it's running out of gas, uh, know uh, you know all the conditions of it. So think about anybody that creates a product, a tractor, uh, uh, you know, um, a generator, a kiosk, a drone, uh, you know, um, those types that. You know, um, oil and gas pumps, uh, those types, yeah, all of those people are our potential are our customers that integrate our technology. And then from a tracking perspective, you know, if you think about any of the large uh, OEMs that uh, build things uh, and want to move things from point A to point B and, and track them a Boeing or something like that. Cool. So as we're coming towards the close of our time together, I'm curious you mentioned MinCup and you mentioned some things like that. How can the Minnesota ecosystem get better at supporting entrepreneurs? What's missing? What needs to be added in? Or is it good as it is? Well, you know, I think it's a lot better today than it was seven years ago. I think there's a lot more collaboration. I think, you know, the Minnesota launch is uh, very exciting. Uh, you know, uh, Mindy's done a great job pulling uh, uh, things together. Uh, you got, you know, entrepreneurial kickoffs you've got the Kabari Institute which is behind you there there's uh, uh, there's different <laughs> there you go uh, uh, you know we've got the uh, you know the, the collider group here in uh, in Rochester uh, so I mean these are all really I mean not, not all of them but a good chunk of them have been created in the last four or five years or have, have evolved uh, you know you've got the various boot camps uh, going on in uh, in the Minneapolis area uh, Lots of competitions, mini you NO. Uh, you know, there's, so I, I think there's a lot going on. Uh, you know, again, I think uh, there's been a good initiative now to start helping people understand that these resources are available. I think that needs to continue. Um, and I think it's reaching down, you know, reaching out into, um, you know, into, into students and college level. Um, you know, the, uh, if I think about um, what could, it, could they do better? Uh, you know, I think that continued awareness, um, just saying, hey, we're here, uh, trying to uh, take away the fear of, uh, hey, we're not trying to steal your business idea. Uh, we're not trying to steal your company from you. I mean, I think those are the initial uh, 
kind of fears I hear or see is like, well, you know, if I work with them, what are they going to do? What do they want? You know, right. uh, and there is some, you know, our groups out there that want some things, but uh, I think uh, uh, educating from that perspective is, is very helpful. Um, you know, obviously during this COVID time, it's hard to network. It's hard to get, uh, get that, you know, face-to-face stuff going on, but we've got to figure out a way to do that. And, uh, and I figure, figure out a way to, uh, to support, um, you know, um, there's probably, uh, you know, I think some of the larger organizations are now allowing, you know, um, startups to come in and, you know, I know in the food space, you know, Land O'Lakes getting involved and stuff, but I think, um, you know, Minnesota's got a lot of corporate, uh, and, and really how do we, uh, how do we actually get access to some of those corporate companies a little easier from a, uh, business development from say selling them, not, not looking for money, but, how do we actually get our products in front of them? Uh, how do you get entrepreneurs in front of, you know, how can the, the startup community and, and you know, the, the community that's helping the startups make that connection to come in and talk about the product, uh, talk about selling the product, not, I don't want money from you. I want you to, you know, I want to show right. you my product to see if you want to buy it. Right. Um, oh, I don't yeah. know if the, I don't know. I haven't seen a lot of that going on at, at, at business development. I see corporate development saying, Hey, you should invest or, but instead saying, Hey, you know, could you use this product or does this solve a problem? If not, what problem do you need solved? Uh, Yeah. So we had originally actually intended to have a fall expo where we could connect local entrepreneurs with some of the more established companies, theoretically to do just those types of things. In the COVID era, that's a little bit more challenging, but we are working on it. But yes, I I agree with you. I think that's a gap in the market right now. Yeah, I could see that as being very helpful because as we talked earlier, getting a sale or getting a customer uh, is very, very important. Uh, And it it proves out that you've got a product, uh, you know, it proves out that you've got something that the market might, you know, the market needs or or desires. Mm -hmm. So that's a key point. If, you know, you could be in the biggest market in the world and have the greatest people in the world and have a bunch of money, but if you don't have a solution, uh, you know, that, that, you know, that solves a problem. So, I mean, identifying what that problem is yeah. and then, and then creating that solution that solves it is what business is all about. Uh, you know, so it's, uh, you know, having money and people and all that stuff. If you, if there, if there's no problem, then, uh, then you might as well just stay home. And, right. uh, and, and, and then if you, if you've identified the problem correctly and you got the right solution, all the other stuff should come together. Well, that's probably a really wise remark to end on. <laughs> so find a problem and then create the solution for the problem, and then everything else will kind of fall. Because yeah, I've place. tried to create a solution to solve a problem that wasn't there, and yeah. I guarantee it, it's a money loser. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. And somehow that makes sense when you're stepping back and not so much when you're in the middle of it sometimes. But right, right. Thank you so much for your time today, Scott. I am yeah, truly thank you. grateful for you sharing this knowledge and having a very frank conversation about what your business was like and starting and getting going and where it is today. And so I really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And if you are interested in more conversations about tech entrepreneurship, um, we would encourage you to go to the Entrepreneurs First, the E1 website at entrepreneur entrepreneursfirst.org to reach into the resources that are available in Southeast Minnesota. Um, And we thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much to Scott for sharing his journey and having this conversation with us today. And thanks for the E1 partnership for bringing these conversations to the community. You can learn more about NimbleLink and the E1 Collaborative through the show notes, through the links in our show notes. And E1 also just launched their own website called entrepreneursfirst.org. And again, you can find that link in our show notes. And you can also find this webinar on the E1's YouTube page. So again, we'll have that in our show notes as well, so you can check it out there. So we're always looking for sponsors for our podcast, for both of our podcasts. So if the mission to amplify the stories of entrepreneurs resonates with you and your business, let us know. Send us an email at rochesterrising at gmail.com or you can fill out the sponsorship request form on our website at rochesterrising.org to learn more about becoming a sponsor. 
And we also have tons of other stories about entrepreneurs on our website at rochesterrising.org, where we have lots of other article and video content amplifying the stories of Rochester-based entrepreneurs. So check it out. All right, that's a wrap for us at the podcast today. Be sure that you subscribe to our podcast wherever you prefer to listen into your audio content. And please rate us as well so that others can find our podcasts and learn more about Rochester entrepreneurs. We'll see you here next Wednesday with a brand new show.